Good evening. Welcome to Lyon College. My name is David Hutchison, Vice President for Advancement, and it is my honor to welcome you this evening to Renew America Together, one of many sessions throughout the country on college campuses promoting understanding and civil discourse among students, staff, and faculty, and our larger communities. We believe strongly here in our role as a liberal arts college to provide a forum for dialogue and conversation. So we're delighted to partner with Renew America Together, which is founded by General Wesley Clark as a not-for-profit organization designed to promote and achieve greater common ground in America by reducing partisan division and gridlock. Its mission is to revitalize public and political discourse by teaching and promoting civics, citizenship, and civility. It's also my privilege to introduce to you with a few brief uh, biographical remarks on this evening's speakers. First, a native of Magnolia, Arkansas, Beth Ann Rankin is a seventh generation Arkansan, an honor graduate of Magnolia High School. She's a 1994 magna cum laude graduate of Wachita Baptist University where she obtained a double major in music and history. In 2013, she received a Master's of Public Administration degree from Southern Arkansas University. Beth Ann was chosen Miss Arkansas 1994 and traveled the state during her year of service promoting her Excellence in Youth Leadership Program, presenting 158 school programs across the state. Beth Ann served as the State Federal Affairs Policy Advisor in Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee's office and liaison to the National Governors Association, Southern Governors Association, Council of State Governments, Capitol Hill, and the White House. In 04, Beth Ann founded Beth Ann Productions Incorporated, a classical and performing arts teaching studio. A nationally certified teacher of music, she also co-hosted the Scarlet Thread Radio talk show and spoke at women's conferences and leadership seminars, as well as appeared on Fox Business Channel. A two-time candidate for the United States Congress, Beth Ann won the Republican primary in Arkansas's 4th Congressional District in 2010 by carrying 27 of 29 counties. Next, General Wesley Clark is a businessman, educator, writer, and commentator. He serves as chairman and CEO of Wesley K. Clark & Associates, a strategic consulting firm chairman and founder of Invera, a licensed investment bank, chairman of Energy Security Partners, as well as numerous corporate boards, including PNK Petroleum and Lee Gold Mining. He is active in energy, including oil and gas, biofuels, electric power and batteries, finance and security. In the non-for-profit space, he is a senior fellow at UCLA's Berkeley Center for International Relations director of the Atlantic Council, and founding chair of City Year Little Rock, North Little Rock, and president and founder of Renew America Together. General Clark is a retired four-star general after 38 years in the United States Army, having served in his last assignments as commander of U.S. Southern Command, and then as commander of U.S. European Command, Supreme Allied Commander Europe. He graduated first in his class at West Point and completed degrees in philosophy, politics, and economics at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar. While serving in Vietnam, he commanded an infantry company in combat where he was severely wounded and evacuated home on a stretcher. He later commanded at the battalion, brigade, and division level and served in a number of significant staff positions, including service as the Director of Strategic Plans and Policy. He was the principal author of both the U.S. National Military Strategy and Joint Vision 2010, prescribing U.S. warfighting for full-spectrum dominance. He also worked with Ambassador Richard Holbrook in the Dayton peace process, where he helped write and negotiate significant portions of the 1995 Dayton Peace Agreement. In his final assignment as Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, he led NATO forces to victory in Operation Allied Force a 78-day air campaign backed by ground invasion planning and a diplomatic process saving 1.5 million Albanians from ethnic cleansing. His awards include the Presidential Medal of Freedom, Defense Distinguished Service Medal, Silver Star, Bronze Star, Purple Heart, honorary knighthoods from the British and Dutch governments, 
and numerous other awards, including award of Commander of the Legion of Honor of France. He has also been awarded the Department of State Distinguished Service Award and numerous honorary doctorates and civilian honors. Finally, our moderator for this evening is Dr. Bradley Gitz. He received his doctorate in political science from the University of Illinois and taught at Illinois, the University of Alabama, and Lafayette College before assuming his current position as the William Jefferson Clinton Professor of International Politics here at Lyon College. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please join me in welcoming this evening's speakers. Thank you, David, for the introductions. Can everybody hear? I'm using the handheld mic here. Um, and I'm honored to be here tonight and to share the stage with our distinguished guests. And I'm glad to see the turnout that we have here. I look forward to an interesting evening. And it's going to unfold in, in really several parts. Um, <clears throat> we'll begin with a short presentation from each of our distinguished guests. Uh, and then we'll move into a general discussion. Uh, I'll throw out a few questions uh, to get that rolling, and then I'll stay out of the way as much as possible uh, thereafter. And then we'll eventually open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, so those of you in the audience might be thinking about questions you might ask. Uh, there's two, what, two mics, one in each aisle, that uh, will make that possible. And again, welcome, and we'll turn first to uh, General Clark for his presentation. Well, thank you, Bradley. Thanks, David, for that introduction. Beth Ann, it's great to be with you here and, um, and at Lyon College. Thank you. So <clears throat> just I wanted to just say a couple of things in sort of sort of setting the stage here. And, um, and we, 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 we hear that this is the most divided American electorate and the nastiest politics in anybody's memory. Some people say it's worse than the period before the American Civil War. And, um, and yet, when I go around and, and, and meet people, it seems to me like most people mostly agree on most everything. Sometimes there's differences in priorities, differences in intensity of, of, of feeling, but, but maybe uh, this is my thesis. And maybe we'll find out if it's true or not. But the idea is that, that basically there are less divisions in the American populace than what you might believe by listening to the media. Because actually both the political parties and the media, they make their existence possible by emphasizing the differences and distinctions rather than the common values and common interests. It wasn't always this way in America exactly back in the back uh, in the 1950s. Our political parties were all mixed up. There were conservative Democrats and liberal Democrats and liberal Republicans and conservative Republicans. And the political scientists used to complain that American parties, they didn't make sense. Why couldn't we be more like British parties that are either liberal or labor or conservative? Um, that's changed. I mean, our parties have sort of clarified their positions. And back in the 50s also, there was something called the Fairness in Media Act. So when I was a little kid, Walter Cronkite and, uh, on CBS and Huntley Brinkley on, on NBC, everybody listened to the same news. But in the 1980s, in an effort uh, for greater freedom and less government regulation in any way, I mean, who could, how do you know if the media is fair? So they just threw the law out. And so then it became a matter of you could listen to you could wish, listen to Rush Limbaugh, you could listen to Rachel Maddow, and uh, and there's no distinction in between. But each one is depending on the revenue from advertisers, and so the larger audience share that they get, and so sort of in a way, the more they are polarizing, the greater the attention. And a political scientist back about 15 years ago came to me after I'd run for office. I wish I had known this before. But he said, General Clark, he said, you know, it's not about your ideas. Politics is about your heart. It's just about feeling. 
And when people hear these ideas, they just go, they just go through the brain and they go right to the emotional side. They don't even process it. And we've done it study after study after study. It's all about emotion. So um, I'm hoping that this is the, the, the first in this year's series of these Renew America talks, and hopefully we'll get to a lot of different places in the country. And hopefully we'll be able to prove the scientists wrong, <laughs> that actually people will think about the issues rather than the emotions and the party label. I don't know. We're going to find out a little bit tonight. If I look at American politics, what I thought of is, and, and, over, and I'm older than a bunch of you here, and if you're a student, just think of me like your old grandfather. I'm going to try to tell you, you know, how I used to go fishing as a kid, and you can ask me real questions. But, but American political history has been through three cycles that I see since the American Civil War. Right after the war, America industrialized, and the great captains of industry became very wealthy. And they did it on the backs of coal miners and steel workers and railroad workers and, and farmers, and people didn't like it. And this led to, it took 20 years, but basically it led to the income tax, the, the election of senators, the Interstate Commerce Commission, and we busted up the so-called trusts where John Rockefeller could own all the oil and, and the Vanderbilts could own all the rail and so forth. <clears throat> we made the economy more competitive, and then we took better care of workers and we recognized the legality of labor unions. And this was the progressive era. And it went all the way through the Depression when, when the Franklin Roosevelt put in Social Security, even into the 1960s when Lyndon Johnson put in Medicare for old people. And then, like the old army motto says, anything worth doing is worth overdoing, the cycle shifted again. And we went back into the, we said government's too active. Government's crowding out the private sector. Taxes are too high. Give it back to the people. So the tax rate was cut from 70% to 28%. And regulations were stripped. We stripped out the Civil Aeronautics Board, fairness in media, uh, limitations on ownership of media in a single community, and so forth. It was the age of Reagan, and private wealth exploded in this country, and entrepreneurship flourished, and the economy grew. Of course, we also had to be careful with the tax cut, because we, you gotta get it right. You don't want a budget deficit. But we're entering the, the fifth decade of the age of Reagan. 40 years now of this. And so you're hearing on the left wing of the Democratic Party a lot of concerns about wealth and people talking about an 8% wealth tax on billionaires and 2% on people making over who have more than 30, 50 million and so forth. Look, this is the sign that the cycles <laughs> it's going to go back again. So a lot of the animus is associated with the end of the cycle. And people, you know, they, they always want to look at a single election, but if you look at the broad reach of American history, it's not about a single election. There are long trends that go forward in this country. And so one election doesn't solve everything. One election just advances it. So you can look ahead. I, I think you're going to see the end of the age of Reagan and greater taxes and government leadership in the economy. I don't know if it's going to be in 2020, 2024, 2028, but all that outcry on the left indicates it's coming. The question is, what are we really interested in? Is it the, is it the um, issues of the moment, gun control, immigration, abortion, um, or is it the longer term issues like uh, climate change, how to manage the ascent of China, how to get um, financial security, how to deal with a, a world that needs U.S. leadership but that's breaking apart. So um, these are, the, these are the, the questions that we have to resolve. If American democracy can't solve those questions, they'll be addressed and solved some other way. Because one way or another, mankind's going to come to grips with war and climate change and all of these larger than national problems. And if it's not our democratic model, maybe it's China's. That's what they believe. I believe in us, they believe in them. And um, 
our, this century will see that sorted out. So tonight's a chance to get your opinions on things and see whether it's true that we're more reason-based or more emotion-based when it comes to the issues it faces in our daily lives. Thank you. Thank you. Turn to Ms. Rankin. All right. Well, first of all, I just want to thank General Clark, uh, Dr. Gitz, and Lyon College for having us here tonight. I know that when I first received the outreach from General Clark, your office, I was truly delighted at the opportunity to be able to come here tonight and to be with you because I'm just passionate about liberty and freedom and the things, the bedrocks, the cornerstones, the foundations that have made this country and the people of this country uh, who we are today and that yearning in the deep of our soul, in the depths of who we are, that we can be better, that we can continue to grow, that we can continue to improve, that we can continue to flourish and breathe free. And so I feel like those passions that I have for liberty, uh, the opportunity to be able to come here and, and open a conversation. I know from my two uh, opportunities to run for the United States Congress in the past in 2010, 2012, and General, I know this is a fun thing for us tonight too. We're here tonight. We're not running for office. I'm not asking for money. For money, we we are not campaigning uh, for any type of self benefit. As far as we hope that we are victorious in a campaign, or we get across the finish line of an election, and, and then you know have the opportunity to hold office, even though that would have been wonderful in in respective regards. I'm sure we would have loved that. But I always tell people the opportunity to run for public office in the United States of America was one of the most richly rewarding and unique American experiences. I will talk about it until the day that I die. It was such a rewarding experience, even though I had back-to-back -back losses. And so I am continually inspired by that. I'm motivated by that. And I'm influenced by the thousands of people that I met along the way who became a part of that story. And it was never just my story, it was our story. And as you can imagine, growing up in Magnolia, deep in the southern part of the state, back in the Governor Bill Clinton days, uh, the Republicans were quite rare. Uh, that's what I grew up as. My, I want to introduce my mom, Tony Rankin. She's here with me tonight and has herself run for office out of principle, wanted to be sure that uh, that voice was heard in a, in a district that traditionally did not uh, lean Republican at all. And so <laughs> she gave it a valiant effort. and was very inspiring to me. But it was, it's the vibrancy of the ideas, of people being able to talk about their ideas, even when there's a difference in opinion, a difference in approach, or even if your end goal is the same and we just differ on how we get there. Sometimes that's where the squabble happens. And so it's going to be fun to hear from you tonight. And I want to say a very special welcome to our students that are in the audience tonight. If you are here, and I know we have at least a few uh, that are here tonight, and you are a student here at Lyon, I applaud you. Thank you for spending the night and the evening with us here. And I, I do recall as a college student, I was a music and a history major. I was not known for being involved in politics because, like I said, I grew up as an Arkansas, very rare Arkansas Republican down in the deep southern part of the state. And uh, we, I didn't know what a victory party was until I was in my 20s. We never went to any victory parties on election night. We just called them watch parties, Dr. Gitz. I mean, that's we just went and watched our candidate lose. That's what we did. And so I, I didn't speak out about any type of political issues at college until my senior year, 1992. And you know what was happening in 1992. Governor Bill Clinton was running for the United States president. And that triggered a lot of events in the state of Arkansas. And one of the events on the campus of Washita Baptist University was a debate between Mike Huckabee, who was in my mind our sacrificial lamb for the Republican Party that we were going to slay on the electoral altar <laughs> during the election once again. And he was running against United States Senator Dale Bumpers. And my professor was offering extra points to go to this debate. And I had met Mike Huckabee and I thought a lot of him, but of course I knew who Senator Bumpers was. So I went to this debate and I just was going to 
faithfully write my notes and go back and get my extra points for class. But something happened that night in that debate, and I saw lived out before me on the stage this free and open exchange of ideas. And I was moved by it, and I was influenced and impacted and inspired by the, these two leaders that would step forward and take the time to come share their ideas and their vision for the country, though it was a bit different, a bit unique for each of them. Their approaches were different. Some, on some issues, they were deeply divided. On others, they were a lot closer together. Uh, but I was impacted that night, and it changed my life. And it allowed me to develop the courage inside of my own soul to, to yearn for that opportunity to be able to articulate ideas. And I will say that when you have the opportunity to share your idea, that if you hear another idea, even if it's not an idea you completely agree with, that it helps sharpen, iron sharpens iron. And I feel like it helps sharpen your ability to be able to articulate what it is that you do think about. And in this country, I know one thing we're all yearning to get back to is just civil discourse. And I know that's a tremendous goal of Renew America together. And so I'm very honored to be here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is the part where we move into a of a general unscripted discussion and I'm not sure where it's going to go but it should be interesting uh, and I get the, the privilege uh, of tossing out a couple of questions and I guess the first question I have for our, for our guests isn't about particular issues it's about how we talk about issues because to me if people can't talk in a civil respectful fashion with each other about issues. Not much is going to be accomplished. Uh, we aren't going to find solutions to pressing problems. And I know each of you referred to the question of civility and maybe factors that have led to deterioration in public discourse, the media, the end of 30, 40 year political cycles. Um, are there other factors, I'm throwing this out for both of you, are there other factors that have made our politics appear nastier, more rough and tumble. I mean, the old saying was, politics ain't beanbag. It seems to be a lot more nasty than it used to be. Uh, are there particular events that have occurred? Uh, are there other technological changes, economic factors? How far back do we go to trace maybe this process of deterioration? Whoever would like to answer that long question first. Well, I think one of the, the variables in that that I am very curious about its impact, I'd be curious to hear from you as well, is the 24-hour news cycle. I, I feel like that that is a very interesting component that has now been introduced, almost like the 12th man on the field, right? I know there's an NFL football game going on tonight. Those of you that are missing that to be here, thank you um, for that. But I always think about those analogies because when you do have that 24-hour news cycle, it means then you have to feed it. And so I think that that has probably prompted a bit of the division that we are seeing because then those television networks get personalities, they get lanes that they stay in, and that sort of drives that conversation as well. And I wonder if that does create the perception that we are more divided than we are. And the other thing, from a realistic standpoint as well, I, you know, I look at our districting and our redistricting, and I know we're in the middle of the United States census coming up in 2020. We'll be looking at those lines and those boundaries for how they draw the districts. I know from 2010 to 2012 when I ran for the United States Congress, it changed for me, and I was running in the same district. And the 4th Congressional District grew from 29 counties to 33 counties. And as a comparison, the 2nd Congressional District has seven counties. So even in the state of Arkansas, you look at the differences, what does that mean for the electorate within those boundaries, within those districts? And now as we continue to draw districts that are safer for certain uh, individuals or, or, or leanings to be uh, elected, is that really a good thing? Because then in that safe district, who are they talking to? They're talking to uh, the, sort of that sounding board that just 
throws back exactly what they're thinking instead of ever having to really engage in those deeper issues. So I don't know, those are two things that jump right out to me, the redistricting, uh, the districts as they are drawn now, are they truly fair? Are they truly as vibrant and competitive? Is that really doing the service for freedom and liberty and the engagement of free and open discourse and debate and civility in our conversations as we would like? Or is it just creating silos and then the 24-hour news cycle? Yeah, you know, I, I think you're right. But, I, but if you put this in perspective, politics has always been nasty. That's it's always true. been It's That's always so been dirty. True. I mean, going back to the beginning, you know, in the, the founding fathers uh, in the Constitutional Convention, they realized this, and when Alexander uh, Hamilton and James Madison wrote the Federalist Papers, they said, if men were angels, there would be no need for government. But since they aren't, let ambition counteract ambition, and interest counteract interest. And that's why they designed, we have an institutionalized combat system in the American government. I mean, it, it really is between the, the, the division of powers, the separation of powers, the roles of each branch of government. And if you look at American history, it's been mean. I mean, actually, Thomas Jefferson hated Alexander Hamilton. I mean, he tried to get him, he tried to get him indicted, he tried to keep Washington from talking with him, and then he went into isolation. And um, Andrew Jackson, I always thought Andrew Jackson was a great president, but boy, people couldn't stand him. He killed the Bank of the United States. Andrew Jackson believed that he was the people against Wall Street, and it was Wall Street even then. And boy, they went after him, hook, line, and sinker. And then there was, you know, Abe Lincoln. People hated Abe Lincoln. He was a scoundrel, he was a tyrant. He was known as a dictator during the Civil War, and he was all set to lose the election of 1864 if it hadn't been for the Sherman taking the city of Atlanta and progress in the Civil War, and then the sort of opposition collapsed. Now, it's always been nasty. You're fighting for power. I mean, politics is how we run the country. When I came back to Arkansas, after my military time, there was a good friend of mine who's a Republican in Little Rock named Wally Rimmel. And Wally said, said, Wes, you may not like politics. He said, it may seem dirty to you, but that's how the country's governed. That's, that's what America is. And it does sometimes get personal. Now, I agree with Beth Ann. There have been changes that have made it worse, like the 24-hour news cycle. But if you look at this, every time there's been a change in the means of communication, there's been weird politics in America. So if you go back and look at, like, when the yellow press emerged, you know, back in the 1850s and 60s, newspapers were kind of rare things, and they would be posted, and people would read them on the wall. But in the 1880s and 90s, the lords of journalism, like William Randolph Hearst and the others, they figured out how to package newspapers and send them all over the place. It was called the yellow press. We got the Spanish-American War out of that. They whipped up sentiment in the public, and it went crazy, even though there was nothing behind it. And then, with the advent of radio, Franklin Roosevelt dominated America. Nobody could stand up to his fireside chats. My stepfather was a Republican banker, and he hated Roosevelt. And, and he'd talk about how you just couldn't, he had, such, he had such a way of communicating to the American people that he demolished the opposition. And then there was the 1960 presidential debate. Now, I'm a little bit ahead of you on this, Beth Ann, but I was in high school when that happened, and I remember Nixon, I mean, Richard Nixon, he was, he was kind of the guy I liked. He was associated with Eisenhower, he was a strategist, he was worried about world affairs, and there was this playboy named Kennedy, and, but, but Kennedy had this wonderful hair, and he was cool, and Nixon sweated across his top <laughs> lip, and, and he had a, like a five o'clock shadow, and I mean, it didn't matter what they said in the debate, Nixon lived. And it was the age of television, and, and, and suddenly it became different. And okay, now we're in the internet, and especially the Twitter, and nobody, Nobody has been a better communicator than Donald Trump. Now, you may not like what he says, or you may love it, but it's quick, it's pertinent, it's on target. If a ship sinks in the Atlantic in a hurricane, Donald Trump is 
to ever tell you about it. If there's a fire, the old is going to tell you who started it. And, I mean, he's got an opinion on everything, and it's entertaining, it's quick, and you don't have to waste a lot of time on it. What it does is it, it's a way of going right to your heart. And so it captures the essence of politics. And this is the question we have to drill down on, you know, in America. You know, if you go all the way back to Plato's Republic, <laughs> Plato didn't believe in a democracy. They called it the Republic, but he actually, it's like, why would a bunch of people be able to govern themselves? I mean, you wouldn't let a bunch of sailors on a ship sail the ship. Why would you let a bunch of people win their own country? It takes somebody who's special to do that. That was the philosopher king model for Plato's Republic. And in fact, when we started this country, it was a republic. You know, there's that famous statement of, yep, the woman asks Ben Franklin, he comes out of the Constitutional Convention, and she, she says, Dr. Franklin, Dr. Franklin, what kind of government are we going to have? And he says, ma'am, it'll be a republic if you can keep it. But over the century and a half, two centuries, we've moved away from being a republic. We're much more democratic now than we are republican. We got rid of the, we got direct election of senators, and we got these political campaigns that are primaries, and not just conventions with the so-called smoke-filled rooms. And we got the 24-hour news cycle on Twitter to bring in the American people. So the latest survey I saw, I don't know if you saw this, but it showed that that now 30% of the American people actually follow politics as their favorite form of entertainment. <laughs> Might that explain the kind of president elected on reality TV? I, is that your next question? <laughs> it's getting there. It's getting there. Uh, but the, speaking of that, I was always taught in my political science education that. Yeah, I was always taught as a political scientist uh, that to win elections in America, particularly presidential elections, you had, each party had to do two things. Uh, you had to get your people to the polls on election day. Democrats had to turn out Democrats, Republicans, Republicans. But equally important, if not more important, you had to win over independents. You had to win over people, the moderates, the people in the political center, uh, somewhere between the two 40-yard lines. Uh, the swing voters, as we call them. And what I'm going to ask, is, is that still true? Or are the two parties playing overwhelmingly these days just to their respective bases, uh, firing up the base, and thereby perhaps leaving 50% of the electorate largely neglected? Well, I, I think, well, and just quickly follow up from a couple of points that you made, too. I think that's such a great reminder that America has always been rough and tumble in politics. You go back and read those early documents from the, the Continental Congress, the Constitutional Convention, you wonder, how did we ever get a document out of this? How did the Declaration of Independence ever actually they happen? They fought duels. Exactly. I mean, they really were. I mean, so it is true that you, we have to continue stating that We've, we've been here before, we've done this before. People have always been passionate about liberty, and they've always been passionate about that. But I think what is amazing to me when I do go back and you read those letters that they wrote back home and you read the, the recording of, of the dialogue that went back and forth, it feels so deeply entrenched and so personal with them. It is amazing that they ever compromised, that they ever worked together, that they ever did some give and take. And yet that's our United States Constitution today, accompanied with those original 10 amendments that uh, got ratified in 1789, finally. And we, we do look at that, and that almost seems miraculous. I mean, we think about what, what would happen today if we had that serious of an issue, that transformative of an issue in front of us, would we, when push came to shove, be able to come together and, and work something out? Uh, together, So it's a great reminder about the history of our country and, and just who we are as a people and that it's okay to have that vibrant discussion, but we also hope that we can move the country forward on, on some of those uh, issues that have been going on. But uh, with your question, and remind me what that was because I got so excited about what you were talking about. Are the parties these days oh, playing more the, to their respective bases, their base. trying to turn out the base more than they're trying to appeal to non-Democrats or non-firm Republicans? No doubt. When you get your base fired up, when you get your base fired up, if they show up at the polls, if they're out there working the neighborhood, knocking on doors, putting up signs, hosting fundraisers, sending in 
donations and contributions, there is no doubt that you're going to build a formidable foundation to your campaign. If you have a sleepy base, you're in trouble. Uh, that's going to be very difficult, I think, to move the needle forward in your, in your particular election, your particular campaign. But I personally believe there is still a fiercely independent middle out there. I think we see it in the state of Arkansas. I think that in, even when I campaigned in 2010, 2012, there were more than a healthy number of individuals they didn't actually want to identify with either party. Uh, even though they might have had pretty much a strong tradition of being an Arkansas Democrat, many times they would say, but I vote for the person. But back then, not many Republicans ran. And so that's probably a, true, a very true statement. They voted for the person. They just didn't have a ton of political options on the ballot. Many of those elections were decided in the primaries and never really made it to the general. Uh, we're seeing a bit of a swing now where it's, it's uh, leaning a little bit where our primaries are, are more dominant a bit on the Republican side. But I do believe there is an independent uh, segment out there. I'd be curious, General, what you think about that and what you've seen in your travels out there. I know Arkansas is sort of my home base. That's what I see here in our state. I'd be curious what you think from your travels. Yeah, well, a couple of things, I mean, that strike me. Number one is um, most of the independents, they're mostly conservative. They're not liberal. I mean, the people that are independent are people like, they don't want to give any money to politicians. They don't want to be affiliated with a political party. But uh, look, America is about life, liberty, you think I'm going to say happiness, but I'm not. America is about life, liberty, and property. The whole idea of freedom to the founding fathers was to pursue the economy, to develop your farm, to have your business. And so it was the protection of property against the state. And so the, there's no class system in America. Even poor people in America hope their children are going to be rich. There's no set of accents like in Britain where people, if they talk the wrong way, say, oh, they'll never be anything because they have a Cockney accent. Uh, there's no nobility in this country. Yeah, there's a lot of people with a lot of money, but after about three generations, if they're not, they don't have good kids and grandkids, that money's gone. And so, I mean, it is still a society that is on the make, where people hope that their children and grandchildren will do better. And so um, when it comes right down to it, you have to win your party base, but then you've got to move to the middle for the national elections if you're in a competitive state. And the middle is conservative. It's not liberal, it's conservative. It's just, you know, it's people, like I met out in Palm Springs a couple of years ago, I was giving a speech out there and um, I circulated through the party reception before the speech and I realize who they are. These are people living on their stock market earnings. Now, they're not real wealthy people by, you know, world standards, but they're retired. They got a, you know, $300,000 home out in uh, Desert Hot Springs, and, uh, and, and they need, you know, their Social Security plus a few tens of thousands of dollars a year, and they love Donald Trump. So they may, you may think that they're concerned about social justice, and they might be, but if you tell them, now, we've got to do more for these, uh, for these people who have different sexual orientations, the GLBTQs, and now that might hurt the stock market a little. They're not going to say, well, General, I'm in favor of social justice. Let's get it done. They don't say that. They're at strict attention and paying very close attention to the market indexes. So what happened in America? Well, I didn't know when I ran for office. There was a guy named Eli Siegel who came out of Boston to help me, and he was a very prominent family. He'd been in Bill Clinton's campaign, and he was, a, he was like a gadfly in Democratic Party politics, a gadfly with about two tons of, of weight behind him, because Eli had been a young man who had changed the structure of the Democratic primary system after the 1968 Chicago fiasco when the, there were riots in the street and Mayor Daley put his shock troops out and killed a bunch of people and, and it destroyed the Democratic Party's faith in itself. So Eli and a group of people set up this system of a primaries where there'd be primaries and there'd be voting and the, and, and the base would get a voice. It wouldn't be just a bunch of people in the Chicago Convention and how many ballots you 
Sometimes they, okay, I'll give you so-and-so on this one if he makes it through the first ballot. We'll vote. That's the way it used to be. And then it was all thrown open and supposedly more transparent. And with the latest reforms, it's more transparent still. So they de-weighted, at least in the Democratic Party, the role of the superdelegates. And what that means is that these, the, the activists in the party in the primary system count more and more. So this may be a factor that looks like it's pushing the party to the left. So I'm looking at this race today. I'm saying, okay, now, Elizabeth and, and Bernie. So Bernie's got a big following on the left, and he's the furthest left. And so Elizabeth, she's left too, but she doesn't want to get pinched out by Bernie. So he's for Medicare for all, and so she's for Medicare for all. But then the question is, okay, but you're going to actually tell these Americans you can't have your health care? You can't have private insurance? You're going to, what, make it illegal to have private insurance? How's it going to go away if people want it? So there's no answer to this yet. There will be an answer that evolves in the course of the campaign. But I just like, select that as an issue to say it starts, you know, with the party base, as Beth Ann was saying, but it's got to work toward the center. But the center is not really in the center. The center is somewhere over here on the right because Americans are concerned about their families, their retirement, getting the kids in college, their pocketbooks, their businesses. They are not people who take to the streets in mass protests, except under the most unusual circumstances. Well, in looking at the primaries too, General, you bring up a great point because we, we constantly think that the deep divisions in our country are with Republicans and Democrats primarily. Then you watch a Democrat primary or that the most previous uh, presidential election, there were 17 Republicans mm -hmm. running for the Republican primary. And you watch one of those debates, as I just watched the Democrat primary recently, you realize how many differences of opinion there are just on the Democrat side or just on the more liberal leaning side. And you realize, you know, the, again, you've got a lot of vibrancy of ideas, a lot of debate, a lot of deep divisions and differences. And you have that opportunity to watch them articulate those ideas. And you do see it leaning in the primaries and then after the primary trying to swing back. And then sometimes you're doing a bit of uh, back tap dancing, trying to get back there and, and rework some of those promises you made in the primary because that's not as appealing in the general election. And, and those candidates are, are working through that. On that note, um, make sure to hold this up high enough. Maybe turn a little bit away from the nature of our politics, the party competition, to some more specific issues. And there'll be, I'm sure, more discussion of this as, as we continue tonight, uh, including from the audience. But I like to play the, if a Martian landed on Earth game sometimes. And if a Martian landed in America and looked around, with fresh eyes, a fresh perspective, and we're asked, what's the biggest problem these people face, the most serious? I'm fairly certain uh, that the answer would be the national debt, that that would be the issue that most seriously imperils the country's future. Um, other problems can't be solved without addressing that at some point, whether it's our global influence, whether it's our various social programs at home. Uh, so why aren't we hearing more about it? Um, Donald Trump doesn't talk about it. Members of Congress don't cite it very often. Um, I don't think I heard the two words national debt once in any of the Democratic debates that have occurred thus far. I've heard a lot of ideas for perhaps expanding it, or making it larger, but I haven't heard anybody say about how to make it smaller. So why is that? What does that say? Bethany, I'm honestly, now you're representing your party, okay? And your party is traditionally the party of frugality and sober judgments about the economy. So what do you think? Well, I will say, <laughs> thanks for that, General Clark. <laughs> that, that was smoothly done. Huh? Wasn't that? Yeah. Don't get to be a four star for nothing. <laughs> I will say when I, this was my driving topic when, when I ran for Congress in 10 and 12. I could not shut up about the national debt. Part of it is I am the daughter of an economist, a free market trade economist, a free enterprise, free and open markets, uh, 
and, and the believing in the, the, the miraculous power of capitalism when really ushered in and allowing people to, to take a harness of their ideas and their innovative entrepreneurial spirit and by, as Adam Smith would say, uh, reaching in and trying to preserve their own self-interest and then that magnifies out and you've actually elevated mankind. I thought of that when I started my own business. I just needed to eat, right? I needed to figure out a way to eat and make some money. And along the way, I launched a teaching academy and probably taught around 400 students who learned music. Uh, that actually originated, yes, in a passion that I have for music, but I also needed to eat. I needed to generate some revenue. So out of a self-interest, I was able to um, have the blessing of having that uh, teaching studio and, and meeting all of those young students. But when, when you think about the level of national debt today, which I think the last I checked, about $22 trillion, is that where we're at? Surpassed GDP. Uh, yes, so isn't it about 100% or even more than 100%? 103%. 103% of GDP. That was not the case when I ran in 10 and 12. Uh, but it is really at a point we've got to discuss it. And what I am hoping is that this will, con will, will come back into the national conversation because it has to. It has to come back in the national conversation. It has to be something, and I don't know what it is about Potomac fever. They, they just, they drink the punch. Uh, when, when you get to Washington, D.C., it is so easy. And Thomas Jefferson warned us of this. He warned us that when you create a national treasury, and he said, God help this country, when they learn that they can grant themselves favors out of the national treasury. And boy, have we learned how to grant ourselves favors out of the national treasury. Now we have this $22 trillion debt, some of which we own ourselves because we've gotten great at buying our own debt, some of which China owns, which is not a good thing um, at all. And of course, that, that is spread out among uh, the American people. And so this has got to come back into the national conversation. And it's just something that I will never quit talking about, whether it's popular or not popular. Uh, and of course, you cannot pay down the national debt if you're running an, an, a national deficit every single year, which we are, because we love to spend money in Washington, D.C. And I would always remind uh, myself as well that you, know, you have visions, you have dreams, you have things that you want to do to elevate the population of the United States of America. But the bottom line is the money in Washington is not government money. It's your money. It's my money. It's our money and it passes through up there and then somehow, I've done a little grant writing over the past several years and it's a little frustrating because you spend weeks and sometimes months writing a grant for money that you sent up there and you're just begging and pleading to get a little bit of it back for your district and you do want to fight to get some of those dollars back where they benefit your district. But we have to remember that that's the people's money. And if we continue to overspend on the national level, there will reach a point, I truly believe this, Dr. Gitz, where there will be a tipping point. And there have been many great nations out there that have found out the hard way that they were not conquered from without, they were defeated from within, from their own irresponsible fiscal decisions where they literally sucked themselves under, and we've got to get a handle on it. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm worried about the national debt, too. I mean. Um, it's always been a problem, you know, in the Revolutionary War, the United States or the, 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 the colonies issued these continental dollars. And, and they, were worth, they were worth next to nothing because they weren't backed by anything. And so we learned early on you couldn't have unlimited debt. But, 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 but the truth is, now look, I, I used to teach economics and this, this, this is a $20 bill. But it's actually not backed by anything. It says, United States of America, Federal Reserve note. Yeah, but, but the Federal Reserve, that's not even really the US government. It's really a bunch of private banks that get together. There's no gold behind this. It's not exchangeable into anything. This piece of paper is probably not worth one penny. That's probably what it costs to print it. And yet, it's accepted. You can go to Mexico, I was in Mexico not too long ago, they've got $20, yeah, it's not a Mexican peso, but he liked it. And the same thing's true in Europe. They like our money, and as long as people believe in the United States government and have faith in our ability to deal with our problems, then how much debt you can run for the country is a lot different 
than how much debt you can run as a family. And one of the things that's very confusing in the American dialogue is that people say, we well, you know, I can't run up unlimited debt, I have to pay my bills. But that's not quite true with the government because we are bringing other people's resources in from around the world to invest and believe in our money. There are billions of dollars floating out there in the world economy that they're U.S. dollars, and they don't belong to us, but people believe in them. And they're not connected to, you know, what's happening day to day in the United States in your pocketbook. They're connected to the belief that the United States is a leading country, that it's the safest form of, uh, of a memor uh, medium of exchange, the safest way to store your value. And as long as we maintain that belief, we shouldn't be running as much debt as we are. It is dangerous because at some point, some 26-year-old Harvard MBA working for some big bank in New York is going to create some model and he's going to brief it at a conference. He's going to say, in the next 17 days, the United States currency will crash because of, and everybody's going to say, oh, God, the currency is going to crash. Shit. Me that, you know, and that's called contagion. And when the contagion happens and people try to unload that debt, then it's just like the old bank runs that used to happen in the state of Arkansas. You know, my, my great grandfather owned an engineering company in Dardanelle. In 1893, there was a run on the banks in Dardanelle, and he didn't run fast enough. And uh, he lost all his money in that bank run because people lost, they lost credit, faith in the credit of the United States. And, um, and the banks, people wanted their money out of those banks. Those banks gave them the money back. And if you were the last one to get there, that bank didn't have any money. And um, that's still a risk. So I think, you know, I agree with Beth Ann, we gotta be careful about it. But I wouldn't put resolving the national debt at a higher priority than let's say maintaining income for our senior citizens, providing quality education for our young people, getting preschool in there for every child in America, and making sure each and every American has the opportunity to get the education they need to be all they can be. And I would add to that one other thing that we've got to do with our resources. We've got to deal with the problem in this country caused by, um, by free trade. I'm an economist, too, and I was a big believer in free trade and market adjustment. And the theory was, hey, you know, we're gonna, everybody's going to be better off with trade. You're going to get everyday low prices from stuff built in China, and uh, the people that are unemployed at the local hardware store because Walmart came in, well, they're going to get other jobs. But the truth is, and I found this out campaigning for, for office, it's really hard when you lose your job and you're in your 40s and 50s and you're settled in a community, it is really hard to get another job that's equal. I was in Racine, Wisconsin. I was asking a guy who was driving me around. I was campaigning for John Kerry. I said, what's it like in Racine? He said, oh, great town. Used to be really wonderful. We're driving past these nice little suburbs with these one-car garages and green lawns and nice sidewalks. He said, he said, I grew up here. He said, there were six big auto plants in town. Why? Well, you graduate from high school, you get a job in the, in the plant, the union takes care of you, you're starting at like $14, $15 an hour. Uh, pretty soon you're in 30 night, Thursday night bowling leagues, you get married, you're making $40 an hour with overtime. It was a good life, he said, but now five of those six companies are gone. The six ones, one third shut down. He said, um, I can't move because no one's going to buy my house. My daughter's in the state university. If I move out of state, we've got to pay out of state tuition for her. My wife's got a job. I said, well, what are you doing? He said, well, I get $11 an hour handling baggage at the airport. And I got $8 an hour working in a fast food store at night. And that, that's, that's, what, that's not what America should be. We should be taking those people that are displaced, and we should put our national resources into getting them continuing education, adult education, and retraining them and putting a system in place where we know where the job openings are. It's too easy for people to say, well, you know, I was a, I, I worked in a machine shop and I just don't really, I'm not a computer programmer. 
And, you know, I'm 40 years old, I'm too old to learn. You're never too old to learn. And we've got to create that concept in American society that we can grow and grow and grow, and we keep our information coming in, and we learn things all our lives. Now, if we can do that, I'm in favor of even increasing deficit spending to get that done, because we'll get so much out of it. So I'm a little flexible on the national debt. I'd say the greatest threat to America right now, Bradley, is economic insecurity. Okay, that leads into a question that I'll stop and, it there. and I'd love to say something too. I've, I've, I've always said this too. The federal government could learn a lot from the state of Arkansas because we have a balanced budget amendment here in this state, and we are required by the Constitution of our state to balance our budget. And so legislators, when they go to Little Rock at the state capitol, they have to decide ahead of time what their priorities are. And I've always believed that if government knew ahead of time this is exactly how much you are going to have to spend, then you're going to prioritize just like you listed priorities right there. I think our government would prioritize more if they knew that this is the amount that you have to spend. And just like here in the state of Arkansas, we have the Revenue Stabilization Act, where actually if, if we don't bring in enough revenue to meet all of those, then category A gets funded, category B may or may not. And so it is actually predetermined what the fiscal and financial responsibilities and priorities are to be spent, and that has kept the state of Arkansas in a great fiscal pattern. And I do, I would be curious, I, normally I'm very fiercely defensive of the United States Constitution. I don't support amendments for anything normally. Uh, the one that I've always at least kept on the table was a balanced budget amendment for the federal government, because I feel like even if you have to phase it in, I feel like over time, prioritizing those spending amounts, having those conversations, and, and re restraining the federal government, because at some point we will pay the piper, uh, I believe. I just don't see, as a matter of fact, talking about Federalist Papers, it was either Hamilton or Madison, one of them said, here's your political arithmetic for you, two plus two is not four. And they were right, and that was, you know, back in the 1700s that politicians would <laughs> tell you that, to, you know, two, two plus two in their math, if you look at what they're giving you, sometimes it does not add up to four, and we know it should be four. And so I feel like we all have a responsibility in keeping that conversation going. Thank you. So here, I, I just want to pick up on something. Look, we went through the Depression in this country in 1930, uh, 29 and 30, and um, Herbert Hoover was voted out of office because he, 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 couldn't get, he couldn't figure out what to do, but he did believe in a balanced budget. And so what that meant was when economic activity contracted and federal tax receipts were reduced, then you had to reduce federal expenditures. And so when you reduced federal expenditures, you then cut activities that would employ people. And this further lowered economic activity. And so the risk of a balanced budget agreement, or even an amendment, is it's so binding and so restrictive that in the ordinary course of the business cycle, if you followed it strictly, you might deepen the economic cycles in the economy and create more hardship when in reality what you're trying to do with federal expenditures, in fiscal theory at least, is stabilize the output so that if automobiles, if there's too many automobiles produced and they're not sold this year and they start laying off auto workers in Detroit, then those people get unemployment insurance so that the grocery stores in Detroit are still selling groceries so they're not thrown out of their houses and so forth. So we have automatic stabilizers in and those automatic stabilizers run against the grain of a balanced budget agreement. And that's where the debate is on the balanced budget agreement, because if you figure the economy should be growing at a, let's say, nominally 3.5%, 4% rate, and you have 10% of the people unemployed, well, then you're losing 10% of that growth each year because they're idle. So if you could get them into the stream of economic activity, your economy would grow more, and your taxes would be your tax revenues would be increased and you would actually be reducing the budget deficit. This actually was what we were doing in 2010 through 2016. We were actually each year employing more people 
and the number of people on food stamps and on welfare and on unemployment insurance was going down. And the budget deficit was shrinking each year until we gave a tax cut in early 2017 to businesses. That's where we got the trillion dollar deficit. And we gave that tax cut with the assumption that these businesses would invest and create more jobs. But in fact, I'm a businessman, and it's hard to figure out what to do with extra money other than put it in your pocket. I I'm just being honest, because businesses, big businesses, they don't just go out there and spend money willy-nilly. They have to have plans. So if you give them a windfall and say, hey, bud, you got an extra $5 million coming in in revenue. Why don't you make some more jobs for people? Most of them don't know how to do that. And what they did instead was they gave the money back to the owners of the businesses. And they did it by buying back the business's stock and raising the value of the stock. So if you were an owner of the business, you were able to then share, sell the shares of the stock for more money than you otherwise would have. So um, that's, that's what's happened right now. I mean, it wasn't happening when you were running and you were concerned about it back then, but right now we're in a position where um, we've given businesses this huge tax cut. They have not responded with increased investment. They've responded with a trillion dollar stock buyback program over the last year. It's made people like me a lot more comfortable. It's why the Dow is up to 20, 27,000 on some days, when it really should have been about 18 or 19,000. It's at kind of record levels because businesses don't know what to do with their money but buy back their own stock. Thank you. Um, you mentioned economic insecurity, and I think that was a major factor in the 2016 presidential election, particularly in places like Wisconsin. Uh, I grew up near that area. I, you did? We're seeing yeah. Janesville, Beloit, Rockford, um, the industrialization, dislocation. Uh, Donald Trump won Michigan, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Wisconsin, uh, partly because of some of those fears. Yeah. Uh, and of course, that leads into questions of the impact of the global marketplace, outsourcing, et cetera, jobs being shifted abroad. And that leads, in turn, into the question of China. Uh, and we now have a tariff war going on with China. Uh, I'm going to throw a really difficult one out there. If Donald Trump's approach to China is the wrong one, what's the right one? What should we do differently when it comes to trade with China? Well, Beth Ann, let me take this one first because I've been to China a lot. And um, I don't know how much you've traveled over there, but I started going there in 1983 when in the first trip I made in China I was an Army Lieutenant Colonel. And, um, we went to Xinjiang up in the northern part of China, and uh, people up there had, they never saw Westerners. And um, there were 13 of us on the trip, most of us were uh, military officers, we had one woman from the CIA, and she had a beautiful red hair, and she was about 5 foot 11. And when we would walk down the street, there would be like 300, 400 Chinese in front of us. And they'd be going like this and saying, what are they saying? What are the barbarians? Are they Russian? What are they saying? Can you understand them? Look at her, how tall she is. And she's looking, you know. And it was the most, we had an American who spoke fluent Chinese with us, and he was telling us this dialogue. And, um, and now, if you go anywhere in China, it's just booming. And they've taken, it's, they're really smart. <laughs> They're really smart. They sent their students to America to get educations and learn from us. And often they got scholarships. And not just like baccalaureate students, I'm talking about engineering PhD and post PhD students who work in our laboratories on government contracts and take credit for inventions. They, they have gotten our investments there. So, They've gotten our learning there. I mean, they went to school on Walmart. Walmart taught them just-in-time logistics. Walmart taught them how to manufacture and get stuff to the ship and order ship time and how to reduce that variable. Walmart taught them inventory management. And believe me, the Chinese are just as smart as we are. 
There was a time in the 1990s when they said, oh, the Chinese, they'll never make it because, you know, for computers, you have to have the Roman alphabet and uh, you can't use Chinese characters. Well, guess what? They do use Chinese characters and they're just as smart as we are. So they've learned from us. They've gotten investments from us. They've stolen our secrets through cybersecurity. And around the world, they're taking their surplus earnings and investing in countries and helping develop those countries and actually um, winning allegiance from some of these countries where we aren't doing as much, particularly in Africa. So we've got a significant problem because they don't agree with us on our basic values. Now, the individual Chinese people are wonderful. When they come over here, you'd be great friends with them, and they love America. But, you know, it's what you were saying, Beth Ann, about freedom and liberty, you know? It's like an infection. When you come from a communist country, and it's still a communist country in China, controlled by the Communist Party, and they come here and they see, well, everybody can say whatever they want, and there's nobody looking over the shoulder, and nobody disappears in the middle of the night, and so why can't we be like that in China? They go home, they've caught the, they've caught the virus of freedom. President Xi Jinping says the greatest threat to China is Western democratic values. So it's not like they're a mirror image of us, and we're like two, you know, sumo wrestlers in the ring going at each other. They're entirely different from us. They have an entirely different system of government. And they want us out of their part of the world. They don't wish us any harm necessarily, but they don't want us infecting their young people. And Asia belongs to China. In fact, if you think about the Chinese character, for, for about 5,000 years of human history, China has been the centerpiece of humanity. Every great invention, printing press, the compass, um, fireworks, everything began in China. During the time of the Roman Empire, the Romans bought silk through the Silk Road network from China because they didn't have it. And for the Chinese, the Romans had the, nothing that China wanted. Everything that the Romans produced, everything that came out of the Mediterranean culture, China had better porcelain, better ships, better woodwork, better crafts, better swords, better steel, better iron. We were inferior until maybe 1800. And Xi Jinping wants to restore China to its rightful place in world affairs. So that's my sort of lead up to this. So what are we going to do? The only way you can work with China is to have allies. You can't go alone against China. Because when you go alone, the Chinese go to the Germans and say, look, the Americans won't sell us this stuff. But anyway, we'd rather have German engineering. And Germany says, oh, this is good for us because this keeps our employment up in Germany. And so they're selling their engineering into China. So during the Cold War, you know, we had, a, we had an agreement with our NATO allies that we would not sell high technology to the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. That agreement's gone. If we're going to deal successfully with China and have them live in a world that is conducive to our values, they can keep their form of government. We're not asking them to become a democracy, but we want respect for our way of government and our values. We've got to have allies. That's my biggest criticism of Donald Trump's approach, Bradley. He's trying to go it alone. You can't. It's not a skyscraper real estate deal. You can't go in there and bully the guy and say, because he's got his own politics to worry about. Now, China right now is losing the trade war with the United States. When you talk to the Chinese, they know it. But you know what the Chinese are telling me? They say, look, it's not good right now, but we know President Trump wants to get reelected, and we know he'll cut a deal with us in order Same to boost thing. the stock market before his election. Mm -hmm. So we just got to hang on for a little while. Wait, wait him out. Yeah. 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 So that's my, how do you see it, Beth Ann? No, and normally I am very much a, a, a free trade advocate because I do believe in the power and exchange of, of, of production. Of, of goods and services, especially goods, to elevate, you know, not only, uh, you know, I've always thought trade is one of the best, uh, best types of foreign aid that you can send to a country. 
is send them products, elevate the livelihood, the standard of living of the people then that, that can purchase those products, then you enable them to be able to create products that then they can sell to us, that maybe they do a better job of producing and creating than we can here. And you have that, that exchange of, of, serve, of, of production and, and goods. Uh, and, and right now, I think our trade deficit with China is about $419 billion. So that means that Americans have bought a lot of stuff from China. I think it's computers, cell phones, clothes, and shoes. I mean, those are the top four of the items that are very popular, that Americans love to buy, that are made in China. And so now, does, does that make the American consumer happy? Does that elevate the American consumer that they're able to purchase these things? So you've got this trade deficit with China that is, is one issue on one level, but on this level, you're talking about immense government corruption and uh, on, the, on the Chinese side. And they have not shown that they, in full faith and good measure, can operate on a level where they are both fair to their, uh, their trading partner and fair to their own people. And so that bothers me tremendously. The human rights abuses bother me tremendously. I feel like that, you know, if we do have an opportunity, Donald Trump, President Trump says he is a negotiator. He's worked with the Chinese a long time. I would like to actually give that an opportunity to see if it is going to work, uh, to see if that will pan out. I, I'm actually excited to see that conversation happen. Uh, I'm very troubled with, I think it's about one in five American companies say that they've had intellectual property stolen by the Chinese. Well, that's got to end. That's our ideas, our innovation, and our entrepreneurial grit and production that's producing those things, and then they're stealing it and running with it and probably selling it back to us. And so we've, we've got to be able to address that. So if that requires some tough negotiation, if that requires some pain in the near term in order to get to a payoff in the long term, I want to give the space to let that happen. This has been going on a long time. I would like to give this president the opportunity to go to the negotiating table and see what can happen. Uh, we really, in the, the grand scheme of things, he has not had that long of an opportunity to be able to really grind this out with them. I would like to give it a chance you know, normally, like I said, normally I'm free trade. I'd like to see this play out and see what happens. Thank you. Um, I've got plenty more questions I could ask. I'm enjoying this. Asking the questions is the fun part, <laughs> the easy part. Uh, but I think it's about time to open up for the audience. And we have microphones in each aisle. Uh, and, and, and while, you, while you're thinking of the questions, I just want to come back on Beth Ann's comments. Look, the thing about it is <clears throat> we do need to do something about China. But the problem that we've got with, I have it with the president's approach, he's trying to do it like the Lone Ranger out there. Okay. And it's not about negotiating. It really isn't because we may browbeat China and we may hurt them, but they're not going to surrender their sovereignty to the United States. They're just not going to do it. They have a totalitarian system, or essentially a totalitarian system, and they can take a lot more pain than we can. Now, our farmers in Arkansas have been really loyal to the president. They really have, and you know, they want to stick with him, and so do I as an American. But you've got to be smart as well as tough. And smart means get your allies on board with you, because if Japan, if Germany, if Brazil, if all the rest of the countries in the world agree with us that China has to play by the rules, be fair, stop undercutting free trade, then China will have to agree. And if we do it by ourselves, it's too easy for everybody else to say, yeah, the Americans are the bad guys, you have a wish to your friends, and, and play us off. So that's my, that's what my concern right now. And maybe it's too late for this president. You know, he's picking a fight with Germany on automobile stuff like this, and uh, even though most of these German automobiles are made in the United States. And he's, and he's, uh, he's a guy who, he likes a good fight. I do too, but you gotta have, you gotta know when to fight and who to fight with. And I think the United States is a much stronger fighter when we're a team player than when we're going it alone. Thank you. Who would like to ask the uh, first question of our guests? Could I ask questions of either one or both? Go to the microphone. Hi, thank you so much for being here. And uh, I volunteer with an organization, Citizens Climate Lobby. And our whole mission is to create the political will for a livable world. And we do that by 
talking respectfully to our Congress people and trying to build a relationship and offering them a solution. And um, when I first joined the organization, we learned a lot of facts and we learned a lot of science and we would go to lobby meetings and then we realized that wasn't working. And so we now ask a lot more questions, asking our Congress people what their solution is. And we tell our own stories because that, like you said, politics is about heart. But what is your, um, your um, advice to me uh, trying to move our conservative Congress people to take the power of Congress and to do something to find a, a climate solution? And the one we're offering is a free market, small government. It's a carbon fee and dividend, which many economists in America believe is the best first thing that we can do. So we're not asking Congress to spend a ton of money. It's a very reasonable, efficient pro uh, program. But my question is, how can we speak? What can we do you know, to, uh, to move our Congress people to action? Yeah. OK. Well, I, I think one of, you know, again, I always love to come back to the entrepreneurial spirit in the United States of America and how powerful that can be. I just saw an article this past week where Amazon is moving toward 100,000 electric cars. Did you see that article? Um, that's the power of an entrepreneur. That's the power of, I think, General, you refer to it as conscious. Uh, conservatism, or, or, or maybe I heard that in your uh, town hall with Governor Ridge when you and Governor Ridge did a similar town hall like this in Pennsylvania. But you, where you, where, what I'd love to see is providing incentives for more entrepreneurs to do things like that. That is, you know, shrinking that carbon footprint, keeping this country beautiful, keeping this world beautiful. I think that is a place of common ground <laughs> that we all have together. It probably really is the path on how we do that, that we might be a little unique and different along the way. But goodness, when you see entrepreneurs stepping up like that because they are hearing it from their consumers, uh, and number and number two, because they have the power to do it. They have the capacity and, and the, the will to do it. And to be able to motivate and challenge other uh, corporate leaders, business leaders, um, private citizens to step forward and to be able to move that needle. But I love it when it bubbles up from the will of the people because we know and we believe in our hearts that it is the right thing. And I believe that, that as this conversation continues to happen and continues to grow, that you will see more and more steps like that. I certainly hope so. So you know, here's what I see. And you're talking about small companies, right? Small. And, if, and if you look at the, just look at the statistics today, in 2019, the rate of small company formation is less than half of what it was in 1975. People just don't form small companies. And if they do, they don't survive. Four out of five startup companies fail in this country. And if you look at the markets and publicly traded companies, you'll find that there's there were over 3,000 publicly traded companies on the NASDAQ, the American Stock Exchange, and the New York Stock Exchange in uh, 2000. Today, there's only about 1,500 companies on those three exchanges. So what's happened? Why is it we're not forming and growing more small companies? And the answer is three things. Number one, we changed the standards for antitrust legislation and prosecution in the 1980s under um, Solicitor General Robert Bork. It used to be that you wouldn't approve mergers of corporations if they threatened to reduce competition in an industry. But under the legislation that came in under Bork and under the guidelines in the Department of Justice, you can approve mergers if they improve the efficiency and potentially reduce prices for consumers. So this is why these telecoms merge and why there are not 15 different uh, mobile phone providers and there's only three or four and there are going to be three real quick. And um, so that's one factor. Second factor is the capital markets. 
which I'm an investment banker, that's what we mean when you go to the banks and ask money for your business. They don't work as well as they used to because they're more centralized and investors are more institutionalized and they're more risk averse. So why would you invest in a young company that's got a you know 80% chance of failing when you can put your money with, let's say, um, Amazon and you know it's it's or Netflix and the odds are they're going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. We don't like to invest in real businesses anymore. We like to invest in software. It has higher margins. It has fewer problems. If you invest in like what we call breaking ground, moving earth, you've got environmental regulations, you've got water regulations, you've got clean air quality regulations, you've got zoning, you've got archaeological regulations. We're trying to put a plant in down near Pine Bluff to take natural gas and turn it into diesel fuel. I never saw so many regulations and so many problems. And it's $500,000 for this study, $100,000 for this study. And, and, and the people that are investing in it, they're asking, well, you know, this is like a binary decision. You're asking me to put millions of dollars in something, and maybe the Corps of Engineers won't approve it because it's covering up some drainage ditch. I'm only slightly exaggerating. But the regulations do make it hard to invest in real assets, and they make it easier to invest in two Stanford graduates in a garage in Silicon Valley who come up with a great idea for a new app on a cell phone. So that's another thing that's stopped small business formation. And the third thing that's really working against it is it's so much easier today to work across city, state, and national boundaries because you've got great telecommunications. You don't need local firms. You can do it through franchises. You can do it through international firms. You can standardize everything. And it's going to get worse in the future because you're going to be able to do it with robotics. So we have real questions going ahead in this economy is, how do we keep people employed? Arkansas used to be a farming state. used to have you know, four or five kids per family, and they were on a farm. That's not the case anymore. You don't need that many people on a farm. You used to have a lot of people in automobile repair. My cousin worked for Regiment Ford down in Little Rock for years, and people would bring their Ford in. Well, that car would break every two or three months. You had to have somebody who knew how to fix it. Electric cars don't break. You got people in truck driving here in Arkansas, but pretty soon you're going to have selfless driving trucks. So are they still going to be truck drivers? So we've got some big issues facing us that are even more powerful in terms of their ability to disrupt us than what we faced over the last 30 years. So um, what are we going to do about it? Better education, review the antitrust standards so we encourage more local development, more equity investment from um, social impact funds to help small businesses get started. And every city needs a relationship with a university or college, like Lyon College, that brings in expertise that, so that people in starting businesses have a university home that they can go to and say, I'm looking for this, I, I think there should be some way to do this with the chemistry, but I don't understand it. And there's a chemistry professor who does understand it there. I mean, that's the model of the future. It's business and universities working together to create technology with government coming in to make sure the financing is there to get it going. Well, now, Will, I've spent a lot of time on a university campus over the past three years, and I often hear students talk about they approaching graduation, I need to get a job, need to get a job, need to get a job, and I'm always uh, eager to smile and say, what about creating a job? Provide a service. Think up something that, that doesn't exist yet. Do you have an idea? Do you have a passion? Is there something that you love to do that could benefit or uplift someone else's life? Could you turn that into a service? Could you create a product? So I think entrepreneurship needs to be taught in this country because I'm not really sure that that is a, sort of a first thought choice among our students today. And I think we're probably losing some pretty powerful ideas that may be nested in the backs of their minds, but they haven't really thought about how to materialize that and turn that into an entrepreneurial idea that they can, then could become an actual business or could grow into something larger 
in the future. But I love the idea of planting the seed of them sort of taking that and pursuing that for their own life. What does that mean to be an entrepreneur? Because, that, and it is tough. I think 50% of all small businesses fail within the first two years. So I mean, you get a pretty quick whiplash uh, of reality if you didn't go into that business fully prepared and hopefully uh, what I prefer even more than going out and getting investment in your business is save up ahead of time. Build yourself a cushion. Don't go off a limb, a fiscal limb to do that. Really think through it. I know timing sometimes with products is important, but it also needs to be a financial preparation that you do emotionally and mentally, uh, not just professionally. But I'd love to continue encouraging that entrepreneurial spirit uh, among our students today, along with the idea of being a lifelong learner. I'm just now getting a doctorate, uh, and I, I love it. It's, uh, it's been a lifelong dream of mine, but learning about how we have to constantly retool, we have to constantly retrain, and sort of setting that as the norm that you might go through multiple careers in your life. You're going to need to be resilient. You're going to need to be flexible. You're going to need to constantly be, be uh, maybe perhaps willing to be mobile and to respond to the opportunities that come up. Or again, maybe have something in your back pocket that could become an opportunity that you can create. And I think a lot of those ideas are out there with the right amount of encouragement and support uh, and preparation on the front end. I think people could pursue those. Other questions? If you could maybe. Income inequality beyond, beyond traditional social welfare programs. Um, what could be done? So the basic cure on income inequality is um, you've got to get people better educations so they can move up in their job skills. So uh, you're, all, you're going to be able to automate a lot of the most low-paying jobs. Fast food jobs are going to go away. McDonald's is already looking at how to have a completely automated McDonald's there. It's really hard to keep fast food people motivated anyway. They come in and they come out. You've got to get them trained. So why not just put robots in there? So these jobs are going to go away. You have to get the education to move up the income chain. But, but I do believe this. I do believe that the government has to do a better job of helping people with mid-career education. So if you want to really work on income inequality, guys who have been repairing cars have to move up into computer programming. People who've been working construction equipment have to know how to work automated, semi-automated construction equipment. And sometimes they have to go to school to do that. And when they go to school to do that, who's going to take care of their family? Who's going to pay them to do that? And if they have to move, how do they move? Is there some, kind of, some company that's going to give them a, a moving allowance? Or is there some other program to do that? When we set up the whole idea of the free market system and the end of the Iron Curtain, we thought we were going to be able to do that. There was a legislation called the Comprehensive Education and Training Act, CETA, that was passed in the 1970s and it has been added to several times, but it never really worked. We don't really know how to identify job opportunities and then train people and then get them to the job opportunity. We have state employment offices. They don't quite work either because um, what you keep hearing in this country is there's like two million jobs out there going begging and people can't find them. They can't find employees, but yet you still find people that are looking for jobs. So we're missing part of the connectivity. I think there's a role for private enterprise to fill that gap and bring young people and um, uh, middle-aged people through the education system into a tracking system and put them in front of the employers who can put them in their jobs. Right now that mechanism is missing and I've worked with a couple of companies that come fairly close to this. But you know at the executive level in America, it, it's like the army. There's uh, these headhunters, they track you in your entire career. Say, oh, you worked at Bristol Meyer, and uh, you know you were, uh, you know, fourth level, uh, and, and 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 you did pretty well there, didn't you? And they know your record, 
And then they call you in the middle of the night and they say, they're looking for somebody, you know, to be executive vice president in this other pharmaceutical firm. Would you be interested in that? Don't tell your employer. And these secret deals go through and you change jobs and move up. But that doesn't help people who are not at the executive level. When you're down in the bowels of the company, there's no one looking out for you. Another way to work on this is through the labor movement. Labor unions are trying to do this, but labor unions are still a little bit jealous of their membership. And so when you go to a building's trade, building trade union and say, you know, you should be really proud the people that used to be your union members, they now moved up and they got their own construction companies. But you know what? They're not proud of that. They say, well, we lost our membership in our union. And so there's resistance to that. So we have to create the organizations and the incentive structure in the society to help people move upward in the society. Well, I would just say, I do think that our, our existing organizations, be they public, private, academic, can all do a better job. Of, I think that we have the programs that have tremendous potential, but I think some of that is unrealized potential. And sometimes, like General was saying, it's just connecting the dots. I know in my corner of the world, the Golden Triangle Economic Development Corporation has just created a website, an online jobs connector, where they continue to hear throughout a four county region that they cover, uh, they continue to hear uh, from companies, oh, we just can't find workers, we can't find workers, we can't find workers. But then they continue to hear from the population, we can't find jobs, we can't find jobs, we can't find jobs. So uh, the, the GTEDC knew We've got workers, we've got jobs, they're not talking to each other. So meanwhile, the workers felt trapped that they couldn't uh, discover uh, potential opportunities that could help them um, mobilize from one uh, income bracket to another income bracket or obtain the skills necessary to be able to do that, which is an important component of it. Uh, where, that, where the education uh, element comes in and the training element and the workforce element comes in uh, and the, the vocational and the technical element comes in, which I think is very important. So I think if there is a way that we can continue breaking down those barriers and getting these conversations together, I know we're close to, Magnolia is close to the defense uh, sector in, in East Camden at Highland Industrial Park where you've got Lockheed Martin and Raytheon and Aero, Aerojet and you've got all these defense contractors down there. So there are, are plenty of jobs, but they were not being able to attract the worker that they needed. They'd fly them in from all over the country. They would come in, they would move there, and then they'd get homesick and move. They'd leave, they'd go back to where they came from because they didn't have roots. They didn't have roots, they hadn't made those connections. And so that was what was missing. And so we continued to hear this. And so the university responded and actually turned their engineering program with the, with the approval of the state of Arkansas, turned it in for, to, from a two year to a four year. And now they're able to meet those engineering demands on all levels. Those will be engineering jobs at all levels. And, but that required a communication. It required a conversation. It required people coming together and sitting at the table and pull it, putting their resources together and doing that. So I hope that we can continue doing a better job of that. Uh, because I do agree with General, General Clark, these jobs are changing, they are changing. And we, our, our workers of the future are going to have to be resilient and, they're, and create a mindset of resiliency because the, otherwise life is going to be disappointing. And we're going to have to get past that where we expect that at some point in life, we're gonna to have to retool, retrain, rethink, and then move forward from there. And I hope that that's something that we can continue to do. Okay, so uh, here's an example where from the Republican side and the Democratic side, you didn't see that much difference in the answer. It takes teamwork, it takes university, it takes some government leadership, it takes private sector, it takes initiative. Um, and this is what we've got to do to move the country forward. Thank you. That's right. Next question. That relates, is this on? Okay, well that really relates, that's why I'm doing it. <laughs> Um, the reason I like Lyon College is its mission statement says there's five characteristics like habitual character traits of a liberally minded person. Um, their intellectual honesty, commitment to truth, fairness to opposing points of view, patience with complexity and ambiguity, 
tolerance of reasoned dissent. So, if a student tells me they know I'm going to hell, I, you know, what am I supposed to do, right? That's not reasoned dissent, but everything else is. And the tradition of Lyon is the union of reason and faith. So everything has to be integrated, right? And so you just said, you know, that things are changing fast. And so what the public is given is this polarized view, and what's real is in between. And so there's this huge gap between fantasy and reality. And for example, on climate change, Bill Gates figured the market would decide, and the market did not decide. So he's gotten together with billionaires <laughs> to try and create this whole way of having a green society. The market never did self-correct because the tragedy of the commons. So that's number one. Uh, number two is, okay, I live in Arkansas. I came from Minnesota. It's a very, very different very. I grew up talking about public policy and how to maintain a middle class. All right, so Arkansans don't like government, but I look around. Your jobs come from military. That's tax money, right? There's a huge military presence that's paid for by taxes. Social security, people retire here. They bring their social security. They bring their Medicare. After Obamacare was um, passed around here in rural areas, all this other health care, that's deficit spending. So, and then in China, right, we depend on them for trade. So to hate government, and then you look at what percentage of the wealth in Arkansas is actually government, and Wal Walmart, for example, their employees qualify for up to $3,000 a year for government-funded <laughs> programs because they pay them so low. Um, so I just want some intellectual honesty, right? And there's the deficit problem that Reagan, W, and Trump, you know, claim to create jobs, but it's all on borrowed money. I mean, the deficit explodes. So there was a group called the Citizens for Responsible, Defi uh, Re Responsible Budget. It was started by Republicans. Before the election, they went through all the policy recommendations of the three candidates. Trump's was going to lead to a trillion dollar deficit. Sanders was going to lead to 50, whatever, half that. And in Cl Clinton's was approximately balanced. But nobody obviously cares about that. So my question is, why can't we have some intellectual honesty about this? You know, just be honest. Well, I will say, I think that that's certainly what General Clark and I are trying to do tonight. I know, but you I know, don't. By coming together and, and having these conversations. And I do want to, to be very clear as well, I haven't heard anybody on this stage tonight say that they hated government. Um, I think that government has an essential role um, in the United States of America. Now, we may disagree over what that role is. Um, you know, I know that there are certain pillars of governmental um, uh, structure and responsibility that are designated by the United States Constitution. And I will say, too, the beauty of it, the beauty of it, that they did foresee, you know, a federal government, but then they also told the federal government what it cannot do. And they reserved for the states certain privileges and responsibilities, not just privileges and freedoms, but responsibilities of, of what the states then would be free to do and, and decide among themselves. And then I always say as well, some of the most effective government you'll ever see in your life is at the local level. Let's bring it down to Batesville. Let's bring it down to your hometown where you might see the mayor in the banana aisle at the grocery store and be able to tell them what's on your mind or give them your opinion and you're going to see them again at, a, at an event uh, next week possibly or run into them at a local uh, little league game. That's the, the beauty of government. Uh, you know, at all the different multiple levels, and yes, it's complex, but I do believe that by having conversations, that is intellectual honesty. And then by having the vibrant idea, exchange of ideas, some things we're closer on than we, than we, we might have envisioned um, at the beginning. Other things we'll continue to talk about because we believe in very passionately. And, but I feel like that's good for our country. 
those conversations are, are good for our country. And so I think just as a, as a general rule on that, I, do, I, I certainly would not want anyone to misread uh, any opinions that have been given tonight of just a blanket hatred of government, because that's certainly not uh, where I stand. I believe government serves a very vital role in this country, or our founding fathers wouldn't have established it. As a matter of fact, that's why they had these conversations about how to establish that government and what the roles of government were going to be. And that's why those, those beginning documents, honestly, it's a miracle that they still exist today. It, it's, it's almost a miraculous thing. They called it the great experiment. And I hope that on, on our watch, that we can keep the great experiment going to hand and pass the torch to another generation. General Clark? Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's funny you bring this up because um, it is, Beth Ann was saying earlier, it's your money. Well, it's also your government. I mean, whose government is it except ours? We're the only nation that actually brought a bunch of people together and formed a government that's ours. Abraham Lincoln said, you know, government of the people, by the people, for the people, that it will not perish from the earth. It's our government. It's not them. It's us. We're electing them. Now, where do we get in trouble? We get in trouble because government can resolve conflicting interests. You might not always like the way it turns out. It could be a zoning issue at local level. It could be the use of um, some federal resources at the state level. Um, it, it could be um, how we deal with a neighboring country at the national level. You may not always like it, but if it's about interests, they can be compromised. Where government has trouble is when it's about values. So it's single issue values, voters, that cause the trouble. In the 1980s, um, after the riots and the civil disobedience of the 60s and early 70s, we begin to talk about the moral majority in this country. And we be begin to talk about value voters. I was in the Army. I'm a big believer in values, and that sort of sounded right to me. I mean, what do we stand for? Our values. But when you put that into the political world and you try to say, well, what's the compromise? Well, there you start having difficulties because some values don't compromise. And so when you're dealing with interests, you can compromise. So one of the things that's caused a problem for us is we've thrown our values into question, into the political system, and we're voting on values. And at the national level, that gets a lot of heat. I remember when we were talking about in the 1990s, what about um, gays in the military? And that was a hugely controversial issue that was values-based. And yet, over 30 years, look how the values have changed on this and all the way to where we permit you know, marriage, uh, gay marriage and so forth, and it's not even questioned throughout most of the United States. It's the majority opinion. So values change, but when they're in politics, they become controversial and difficult to deal with. I'll tell you something else about this issue and about government. I was a one-star general out at Fort Irwin in 1990 during the build-up to the Gulf War, and Congressman Newt, Newt Gingrich came out. And um, he's about my age, and he's very articulate and smart, you know, and he, he was my guest out there, and we were going to show him the training operations as we did the build-up of the National Guard for the Gulf War. And um, Congressman Gingrich, he's a politician. He wants to be liked. So he said, uh, you know, General said, uh, my stepfather, he was in the military, and uh, I grew up at Fort Bend in Georgia. He said, I, I, I'm a big believer in the armed forces and the military. I used to teach military history, he said. And so um, he said, you know, we people in Congress, uh, we'll be, we be learning from you generals because, you know, politics is a lot like war, and I bet you've got a lot of ways to win battles that we could learn from. Well, I was just, you know, being a polite host, and I said, uh, oh, yeah, Congressman, I mean, uh, sure, I mean, we'd love to, you know, we can always talk and blah, 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 blah. But I, conversation stuck in my mind because, actually, politics is the opposite of war. And one of the values that's become dominant in American politics over the last 30 years is this idea that you're 
people on the other party are your enemy, your opponent, when in reality, they're not. You should both be working together for the common good of the country. But in the 1990s, what my friend Newt decided was that in order to make the Republican Party away from that minority party that you described in 1992, if you didn't stand for something, you were always going to be in the minority party. So, you know, Newt put the hammer down, and, um, and so they did the contract with America, and the Republican Party became a party which was opposed to the Democratic Party. So a lot of the heat about the role of government today derives from the fact that one party has benefited or seem, believes it's benefited from showing that government cannot solve problems at the national level. And the other party has, in a more traditional way, tried to work and solve those problems. One last story, if I could tell it. So um, at, his, at the inauguration in um, uh, early 2009, uh, Vice President Joe Biden gave a speech and he talked about coming into the United States Senate as a young man. He was like 30 years old and he was sort of adopted by the Senate Majority Leader Mike Mansfield who was a U.S. Senator from Montana. They were both Democrats and, and Mike was like 67 years old and put his arm around Joe's shoulder and said, young man, I'm going to do everything I can to help you. I know you've had a terrible accident and you've lost your wife and, and daughters and, and so forth. And so um, after a year or so in the Senate, Joe Biden went to see him one day and there was a senator from South Carolina who was really nasty and mean and saying terrible things. His name was Jesse Helms. And, and, and now this is Biden now, he tells this story. And he says, he says um, I went up to Senator Mansfield and I said, I said, Mr. Leader, that Jesse Helms, a guy that talks like that, well, I, he's prejudiced, he's wrong, he's wrong. He shouldn't even be here in the United States Senate. And, and, and Mike Mansfield said to him, well, would it change your opinion of him if you knew he and his wife had just adopted two orphans from Korea? And Joe said, actually, it would. He said, and Mansfield said, you see, he said, Joe, the point of the United States Senate is that people send the very best people they can elect up here to Washington to represent themselves. And our job is to work together to do what's best for the country. So that speech made a big impact on me because this was 2009. And I have remembered what Newt Gingrich said about politics being like war. And one of the things we have to think our way through here in 21st century America is, is it like war? Or is it like a team sport? And you represent your state or your district and you do the best you can for people. So I hope what we're showing here tonight is, maybe it's a little of both, but mostly it's a team sport and we're trying to do the best we can for America. And I just want to add on that too, because those are great points. And when you're talking about a team sport, I feel very blessed that I was able to work for a governor. Because you do not see this kind of dissension among the governors. And I find that very interesting if you think about it. I mean, the governors across uh, the United States of America, they, they meet multiple times a year, Republican, Democrat, independent. I mean, they're, they're all there. They have these. Uh, meetings that they have and of course there's the Republican Governors Association, there's the Democrat Governors Association, they have those as well, but you do not see this deep, deep division among the governors nearly to the degree that you do in Washington, D.C. And I, I truly believe that's because governors have to go back home to their states and they are solving real problems and they have to do it this year. Whether it's Arkansas and you're, doing, you're dealing with a balanced budget amendment and you have to make real choices that impact real people that have real needs and you have a heart for trying to make everybody's life better uh, under your watch as governor. And I feel like that, that is a great um, sort of a, a goal that we can move toward of trying to elevate the conversation in this country. I, I, don't, I don't know, it's been a, a minute since I've been in the governor's office with Governor Mike Huckabee, but I would venture to guess that it's probably not a lot different among the governors and the governor's staffs as they put their heads together and work on real problems. And as a matter of fact, they have to lobby Washington, D.C. too. 
I mean, they are constantly reminding the federal government of their limits as a federal government um, and, and bringing it back to the states and believing that the states really can be laboratories of innovation and that that is where some great ideas can, can not only begin but can be nurtured and watered and those seeds can be planted and it can grow through time. So it's an exciting thing to think about where we see an example of people working together and that was always inspiring to me. I have a super quick question. Um, I have two major issues that I just can't stop thinking about that seem to sort of be liberal issues right now, and that's climate change as well as election security. Um, like I said, they seem to kind of be uh, democratic issues. It seems like those are the only people talking about it. So I wonder how do we bring up issues that can impact essentially the way that the country looks and the way that the earth looks, um, how do we make those more bipartisan and how do we have those conversations with people who are denying um, facts? Election security, climate change. And climate change. So, okay, so let, me, let me take off all this from first. Look, the, the evidence, it's a good question because on both issues, climate change and election security, the evidence is overwhelming. The science is incontrovertible. Mankind's activities are causing changes in the climate. We're pumping around the Earth 45 billion tons a year of carbon into the atmosphere. And we know that changes the ability of the atmosphere to exhaust the heat into outer space at night. That carbon dioxide in the atmosphere reflects infrared radiation back to the earth and so bit by bit the earth is warming the oceans are warming the glaciers are melting sea levels are rising oceans are becoming more acidic etc um, the evidence is pretty clear on this so um, why is it that the united states doesn't take action on election security it's pretty clear the russians were deeply involved in the last election why is it that we didn't get through Congress until right now when Senator Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has approved, but it's not passed yet, a $250 million election security bill. Why is that? Okay, I mean, this is where American politics got to, got to tell the truth here. And, um, and, and Beth Ann, um, I'm not trying to, you know, put you on the spot. You might agree with me or you might not, but look, What's happened is the role of money in politics has gotten greater and greater and greater in this country. People keep talking about finance reform. John McCain's key issue was election finance reform. They believe people should vote on the issues, but what's happened instead is money talks. It takes money to be elected, and it takes money to be reelected. And now, after the passage of this Supreme Court um, uh, ruling in 2010 called Citizens United, it's possible for corporations to put unlimited amount of money into what's called dark organizations. It's, uh, it's uh, political action committees that are not officially affiliated with a specific candidate, but can reinforce and echo the issues. You know, for a hundred years in America, we tried to keep corporations away from politics because we knew corporations didn't have the best interest of individuals at heart. Out in Montana, they passed a law that said corporations got to stay out of politics because big mining corporations out there were, were tearing the state to pieces and hurting the ranchers and the, and the farmers out there. Uh, but that's all been overthrown as a result of Citizens United. So you've got to have direct contributions. The maximum an individual can contribute is I think in this election cycle, 2,800. And, um, and so it goes up by 100 or $200 every election cycle. And then beyond that, you've got to have these outside organizations who will echo your views or attack your opponents. So there's, um, these elections now are billion dollar issues. And you've got to get that billion dollars from somewhere. So it's coming in on some of it is foreign money coming in, and that's the election security issue. So let's say you're a, an American citizen with a business in Russia. 
there's nothing to keep you from taking the profits from that business in Russia, putting it through your income tax, of course, and then contributing it to, to a corporate account in the United States and influencing an election. You're an American citizen, you have the right to do it. And as far as climate change is concerned, if you're a big oil corporation and you're worried about your future, then you're going to tell the people that represent you, please, please, don't go along with climate change. In fact, there's a lawsuit going, two of them going, against these big oil companies. They detected climate change back in the 1970s, and they were just like big tobacco. When big tobacco actually knew that smoking caused cancer, they hushed it up. And these big oil companies, they show in their internal records, they knew that emissions of carbon dioxide were causing climate change, but they didn't tell anybody. So it's about money in politics. So you've got to confront the issue head on and get the elect electorate aware of it and educated on it. And then hopefully you can reduce the role of money in politics so we get back to what's the people's interest rather than just what's the corporate interest. You know, there's not that many of us that can give $2,800 to every candidate, once in a primary and once in the general election. So money talks anyway, and wealthy people have a bigger voice because of that. But then when you add to it the corporate money, you know it's hard for individuals who are concerned people out in the electorate who are doing their homework and have opinions, it's hard for their opinion to stick. So that's why I'm a believer with uh, John McCain that you need election finance reform to reduce the role of money in politics. I would completely agree that what we are doing now is not working. And I, I do think we've got to have a national conversation about this, especially, and I think that this continues to harm uh, dialogue among individuals and among the electorate, because you have uh, political committees out there and political organizations that can raise money, they can get engaged in a campaign so long as there's no direct dialogue with the candidate itself, but only pretty much if the organization tells the, the electorate what it's against instead of what it's for. Like they can't be for the candidate, so they've got to either be against the other candidate or tell you a lot of things that they're against instead of what they're for. So even by design, the DNA of how this is crafted and created has a negative impact, has a very sour taste in people's mouths. Uh, I, they keep claiming that the statistics show that negative television ads work. I hate that, if that's true, uh, in my heart I don't want to believe that, um, that negative ads work and that that's where it's at, but I think that we've got to clean up our system. Uh, you know, how to solve that, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious, you know, what you all might think about if, if it's just, you know, unlimited contributions but full disclosure, where you actually know who's giving the money and it's not hidden up underneath these ambiguous names where you have to, like, go look them up and find out who's what, who's actually behind this particular political action committee or who's actually behind this? Is that just a, you know, a facade of who's actually running it? You have to do all this digging and everything's behind. I don't like that. It needs to be transparent. It needs to be uh, out there. The main thing is, having been a candidate, I want to be sure that every American can run for office. I do not want it to just be the wealthiest Americans that can run for office. It needs to be anyone. And campaigns are expensive. They are expensive. It takes a financial toll on you to run for office. This is an issue, and I do think it needs to be a conversation we continue to have. I think we agree on that. I think we do. <laughs> See, the purpose of the evening <laughs> is served, right? There is of agreement. I think we, this has been wonderful, but I think we have, according to our schedule, time for maybe one more question. Sure. Um, hi. Um, so you talked a lot of, uh, tonight about how, like, the um, structure of our democracy and stuff like that. Uh, I was recently reading about uh, Athenian democracy, how those elected officials uh, in what was called the, um, the Ecclesia, I think, they, they only got one-year terms. So at the end of that year, they had to present an account of everything that they'd done, all the programs and everything like that that they'd, that they'd initiated, and how successful they were at that. Um, compare that with what we do in America. Uh, it's uh, two-year terms for House of Representatives, six years for Senate, and unlimited. You can get as many as you want. So when they're elected, they don't actually work for, for me. I, don't, I can't give the $2,800. Who do they work for? 
they work for the people that are probably going to be dumping a bunch of money into their pockets when they're up for re-election, right? So the question is, uh, kind of yes or no answer, would you support term limits for, for Congress and, uh, and Senate? I used to say no to that. I used to say no to that very, very quickly. Now, do I love amending the United States Constitution to get term limits? No, I do not. I, I, don't, I don't love that. And you would have to change the United States Constitution. Uh, you know, and again, the more you do that, then you just start tinkering with the Constitution all day long. And I don't really want to be the generation that changed the Constitution continuously for, for every little thing. I would love it if we could solve this problem another way. I've always believed that the ultimate term limit was an election. If people will get out and vote, their vote is powerful. They are the ultimate uh, uh, champions of who can go and who cannot go to uh, represent them at any level, uh, regional, local, state, federal, whatever level that that is. However, because of the things we just talked about, I do feel like there are some variables. The way I would like to get to term limits is to fix these variables, whether it's uh, you know, the, the campaign financing that I think is, is very convoluted, it's a, it's a labyrinth of complexity, ambiguity, uh, dark money that comes in, and it's very difficult to trace. It has a negative impact on the electorate. I, I just, I hate what that's doing to our elective process, and I, I don't, I really hate what it's also doing to our candidates, because then nobody wants to run. Who wants to run and get out there and, and, and disrupt your, 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 your life and your routine and get out there and run and put your name on the ballot and then be smacked by this dark money and you don't even know who's attacking you really? And so I just think there are some things about this that we've got to, to address. I feel like if we can do that, then it will prompt a, a more vibrant and a more effective electoral system where we don't have to do an amendment for term limits. And again, Always give a charge to the American people. Get out and vote. You are the term limit. You are the one. Get, get to the ballot box. Recruit your friends. Get out there and vote, even if you have to hold your nose to do it. You may not love the candidates, the options that you have, but get out there and vote, because that, at the end of the day in this country, I believe that is still the ultimate power. You know, um, one of the great congressmen ever in the United States Congress was his name was Wilbur Mills, and he represented the 5th District uh, when we had five congressmen in those old days. And I remember him from when I was a kid. He knew everything. He was the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, which was in charge of finance and taxes. He knew every item in the budget. He was as smart as a whip. And if you went in there as a lobbyist and you tried to, you thought you were going to pull the wool over Wilbur Mills, well, he's going to throw you out of there because he knew more about it than you did, because he'd been there year after year after year. I look at term limits, I, I understand the purpose of them, it's always good to have new faces um, in office and you don't like to see people sort of get so used to their office that they take it for granted. You know, when you're in public office and your title is congressman or senator, that's just your title. That's not who you are, that office doesn't belong to you have it because you have the trust of the people, and you have to regain that trust at every election. And that's what you're supposed to do again in the United States. But the idea of term limits seemed to come into the country about 30 years ago as a way of sort of getting rid of long-standing legislators in, in office. It was like, uh, okay, you've been here, you know too much, you're out. And when you looked at it, what you got was a greater influence by lobbyists. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing about lobbyists is they're not elected, and they're not accountable. You don't know what they're saying. You don't know who they represent exactly. And they're whispering in the ear of the representative or congressman or senator because the congressman or senator actually doesn't know a lot about whatever that issue is. There's a role for lobbyists because you have to get information. And they're the middlemen between the companies, the universities or whatever, and the elected representatives. But the problem with term limits is you're giving a lot of power to that lobbyist. And that doesn't always lead you to the best legislation. So um, I kind of agree, we need finance reform, 
need the right people up there, need to take the dark money out of politics. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't mess with the term limits on our federal representatives right now. And I'd be looking real hard at whether it's made the government in the state of Arkansas better or not. You know, General, I was just about to say that because we have term limits here in the state of Arkansas. Not for the federal. Not for the, right, right. Just for your, your state representatives, your state senators, and what you end up, and your constitutional offices, and what you see, I don't know if you've noticed it or not, I've noticed political musical chairs. So they might be term limited out of one office, and then they just run for a different office but it, they remain in public service and they continue to run for office. So uh, not across the board, but I think you see that trend growing. If they were in a House district and then they flip to a Senate district or if they're in one constitutional office, they might flip and run for another constitutional office because they were term limited. And so I do think you bring up a great point about really transferring power, and this, this is one of the reasons, other than changing the United States Constitution federally to put in a term limit amendment, but transferring the fat power from the elected official that the people control, ideally, to the lobbyists, and then I would also add career civil servants, uh, career government officials who have been there and they know the ins and the outs, government is complicated, um, and you have those, then you would rely even more heavily on staff giving you advice, bringing you uh, suggestions, recommendations, and again, you're transferring the pow power, then you probably have just taken that and transferred it even further away from you, uh, Julie Q. Citizen, Joe Q. Citizen, being able to vote and have that power. Thank you. Um, I hope everyone's enjoyed tonight. I know I have. Um, well, I want to thank everybody for coming, and, um, and I want to especially uh, thank you, Bradley, for you know for yes. emceeing this thing. I want to thank Ryan thank College for hosting us, and uh, Beth Ann, you and your mom for coming up. My wife made the journey up from Little Rock, wasn't quite <laughs> as far as from Magnolia, but um, and I want to thank all of you who came and participated with us. I want to help. Others do this across America. I hope Beth Ann will participate again. Uh, we've, got a, we've got something really important going here, I believe. We're trying to help, but democracy only works with the interest and education of the electorate. If the electorate doesn't pay attention, if they're not interested, if the electorate's about politics, like I am about the World Series, then <laughs> we're not going to have good government. Now, the fact that 30% Entertainment, mm. that might be a good thing. As long as we can make them read the second and third and fourth sentences in the paragraph. And so we're going to try to do this across the United States. We're going to try to bring people together. We're going to try to get concerned citizens in to go out in the political world. And when the candidates are speaking, 
Get up there and ask those questions and don't let them buffalo you with their biography and their platitude and they're always oh, such a beautiful night and everything. You think, oh, it's such a wonderful personality. You're not electing people just for their personality. They're representing us in a very complicated physical world. And we need the best, the smartest, most capable people there. And it's up to the electors. You all put them there. So thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, General Clark, and Mr. Rankin. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was great.